it's just a great be- uh, blessing to be able to celebrate with you, to be here at this weekend, at this time. Uh, God is good. Amen. So we've all heard this story. It's been spoken about several times over the last uh, 48 hours about the Pentecost experience. We've talked about that that has to be our reality as well. And it's such a great image that nobody knows exactly what it looked like, but I love reflecting and imagining what it must have been like. I've had an opportunity a number of times to be in the upper room and just to kind of stand there and say, what took place here, right? But the reality is, is what took place there can take place in any room, in any auditorium, in any church, in any bedroom, in any tent, anywhere across the world. The Lord isn't ultimately looking just for a room. He's looking for a human heart, right? That he wants to stir in that human heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And we hear in this story, obviously, the the people from every nation, and that's represented here. We have people here from, from Ohio. Pittsburgh, New York, Buffalo, even Cleveland, right? Even Cleveland, the Lord brings people from everywhere together to be able to speak one voice. And to be able to come together in a God and in a power of the Spirit that wants to, and we hear, we've heard this multiple times, John was speaking about it this morning, to be able to send us out, right? That he's got a mission for us, for each one of us, a plan that he desires for us. But it's interesting to reflect on the Gospels that the church chooses for us today. That we all understand this sense of Pentecost and something took place at Pentecost that changed the world forever. Let's not undersell this. It changed the world forever. But there was a lot of groundwork that, was, that led to that place. That, that the Holy Spirit and the relationship with the Holy Spirit culminated in Pentecost, but there was a lot that was taking place before. And that's why the church invites us, I think, beautifully to take a look at the Gospel of John today as we're reflecting on this mission that each one of us is called to, right? Everybody here is called to go out and be a part of mission. What that's going to look like is profoundly different, but everybody here, the Lord has a mission for you, amen? And it is your job to discover what that is. But I'm going to suggest what the church invites us to, to reflect on today, helps us understand more fully and be able to do what, in fact, the Lord asks us to do, amen? So it says in the scriptures today, Jesus said to his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask that my father and he will send you another advocate. And then again, we find near the end of the gospel, I have told you this while I'm with you, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send. This idea of the advocate is kind of a really complicated word. I did a quick uh, search on the scriptures about the word advocate. There are, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight different, at least eight different words, depending on what translation you use for the word advocate. Some translations use paraclete. Some translations use comforter. Some use helper. Some use companion. Some use friend. Some use advocate. I can't read my writing. Seriously, I have no idea what that says, okay? <laughs> All right, and, and, and I was thinking some use buddy. You know, you have another buddy? Doesn't really, I just think that would have been an appropriate one, right? This idea of advocate, it's, there's, again, eight different, trying to, trying to get quite the right word. And you've often heard, I'm sure, about the advocate. One of the examples they use is is a lawyer in a court case, that he is your advocate. And that's not really what it is. It's more like the expert witness. The advocate is the one that, that technically it means the one who is coming in, right? The one who is coming in. So you've got a court case going on. You need an expert witness that's going to save the defense. The advocate is the one who's going to come on. He's going to give this great, if you saw the My Cousin Vinny, it's, it's the woman who comes in and talks about the car and everything changes, right? That's the advocate, okay? The advocate, another image that the scripture uses of the advocate is actually a military situation. You find yourself in a military situation. This particular group is being overrun by the military. You bring in the advocate, and the advocate is the one that, that fixes whatever the situation is. The advocate is the fixer, right? The advocate is the bottom of the ninth, two outs, bases loaded. You call in the advocate, right? The advocate is the one who saves the day. 
The one who saves the day, the one underdog, if you will. Dun, 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 right. So those of you who remember who underdog is, right? Comes in to save the day. That's when, when the Lord says that, that he is giving you an advocate. It's the one who is going to come into the situation. He's going to come into the situation. The Lord has given you, has given us an advocate. And it's interesting that Jesus said it's really, really important that we understand this. This is the 14th chapter of John. It's the Last Supper Discourse. And right before he says this, he says to them, just so you know, I'm going to go away. And he talks about his father's house, and there are many rooms in his house, and, but I'm going to leave you. Imagine, imagine the consternation that must have caused for the disciples. They had spent this time with him, and they have grown to love him. And he says, I'm going to leave you. It's better, as Chris said, it's better that I go. And I'm sure they're like, is it really? I mean, this is going so good, Jesus. Let's just kind of go with this. So he, he kind of drops this bomb that he says, I'm going to leave you. It's better that I go. And then he says, and I'm going to send you an advocate. All right, that one who comes in at the last minute and saves the day, the one who comes in. And then he goes on to say, I will send you an advocate, and there's three things that I think he wants us to reflect on. Who will make his dwelling with you. He will make his dwelling with you. If we're going to be able to go out on mission, brothers and sisters, it's essential that we get this right. That this advocate comes to wants and make his dwelling in us. I would like to suggest that when this becomes reality for us, that, that we come to understand what does it mean that God dwells in me, that I am the tabernacle, literally the tabernacle of God, right? That God, he's going to make his dwelling with me. This changes everything. I mean, that, that, that if I really believe this, I can walk out of here with a profound confidence, right? So much of the mission of Pentecost is out there, but if it's not here first, I'm going to be freaking out out there. But I know that God dwells in me because of the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, I'll send you an advocate, the Holy Spirit, that will dwell. And in that, you will experience the Father and the Son because the Spirit is going to dwell and make that alive in us. Brothers and sisters, I think oftentimes if we're honest, when we're praying, we're looking for the Lord, we look for him out there, and I recognize that he is out there, but he is first and foremost here, in present, dwelling in me. That if we begin to pray and we understand that reality that God dwells in me, our prayer isn't only external, but it becomes internal. God, you are dwelling in me. That you are alive in me. That you animate me. In those moments, and this is what's so beautiful and important, is that that Jesus has just said, I'm going to leave, I'm going to go away, but don't worry, the advocate is going to come and he's going to dwell with you. And brothers and sisters, sometimes that's the only thing I want. In the midst of my fear, right? As a child, you know, you're afraid or you're frightened or you're sick, and all that matters is your father or your mother, they come and they just be with you. They can't fix everything. They're just with you. And that's enough. Again, bearing in mind that Jesus is telling them that they're going to leave, that he's going to leave. Who here hasn't lost a loved one? And all you want to do is just for a moment, just to dwell with them, just for another moment. Jesus says, I'm going to send you an advocate. And I'm going to dwell with you. I'm going to be present to you in your loneliness, in your fear, in your questions, in your anxiety. I'm going to dwell with you. I don't think we can go out on mission and do these great things that the Lord is inviting us to do unless we understand that the advocate dwells with us. Amen? And then he goes on and he says again, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, and he's going to teach you, right? He's going to teach you. This is important for us. We have to ask ourselves, do I want to learn, right? Am I willing to learn? Am I willing, am I willing and able to be humble enough that maybe the Lord has something to teach me? And he tells us, again, this is all culminating in Pentecost, but before he goes, I'm going to dwell with you and I'm going to teach you. And brothers and sisters, we have a great deal to learn, amen? Amen? 
The Lord wants to be able to teach us, to be able to equip us so that we're able to go out. But what I find comfort in this is that I don't, doesn't mean that I have to have all the answers. I know that I'm going to find myself in situations and I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what the best thing, best course of action is, but I do trust that the spirit of Jesus dwells in me and the spirit of Jesus will lead me. And at this moment, he will teach me what it is that I am to do. Because so oftentimes I have no idea. I mean, so many things come across my world that says, Jesus, I just don't know what to do. Teach me. Lead me. What am I supposed to do here? I think that's particularly true for those of you who are parents. I mean, God bless you, right? You have no idea what you're supposed to do. You're, you're facing him with situations that your kids bring to you. It's like there is no book that you can go to. It's like, that's you. what do I do? Okay, here's what I need to do. You need the advocate to teach you, to come in at that moment. And this is what's so important for us to understand, that the Spirit of Jesus wants to encounter us in the moment that we need him. That's the advocate. He comes and he saves the day. I got no idea what I'm supposed to say to my son or daughter. Come, Holy Spirit. Teach me what I'm supposed to say. One of the things that I love about the catechism, when you take a look at the catechism and speaking about the sacrament of marriage, it says that the, it's the first thing, and I also, whenever I do a, a wedding, I tell the couple this, that the catechism says that the, holy, the first gift you received at, at matrimony at the day of marriage is the Holy Spirit. We often equate the Holy Spirit with confirmation or baptism. It's also ordination. It's all the sacraments, right? But in marriage, it says that the Holy Spirit is readily available to the couple. I think that's a really powerful line, that the Holy Spirit is readily available to the couple. I was very graced with a mom and dad who would literally call on that. We'd, but we'd find ourselves in a situation, in a stressful situation, and my mom and dad would say, well, let's just stop and let's just pray for a second. I said, are you serious? Are you serious? It sounds like maybe Chris should have done that before he came home. <laughs> Seriously, though, his wife, Grace, I did, their, I did their wedding. His wife, Grace, is so such a beautiful saint. So it's probably Chris's fault. <laughs> right? But at that moment, right, the, 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 the spirit, the advocate wants to come in and whatever the situation is, I mean, so oftentimes in, in my work, in my office at the university, we're in a situation where we're stressful. It's like, what do we do? I say, let's just stop. Let's just stop. There's nothing so urgent that we can't take 30 seconds and take a breath and say, Jesus, what am I supposed to do here? The Holy Spirit is ever available to teach us what to do. Amen? Spirit is dwelling in us is teaching us in the last one. I don't remember. What is it? Oh, that's right. He'll remind us. Right. <laughs> I always joke that as a priest, 95% of what I do as a priest is tell people something they already know. Right? Telling something. Some of the most profound experiences of my life has simply been the Lord reminding me. In a seminary and sitting in a chapel by myself, having to deal with just a lot of, uh, of death and struggle with babies that I'd been ministering to and families that I'd been ministering to. And just in that moment, there was just this profound darkness and, and this weight that was upon me, not knowing what I was supposed to do, not what, knowing what I was supposed to do when I'm confronted by these situations as a priest. In the middle of that, on a Thursday evening, I'm sitting in front of a chapel. The Lord had been barren and distant and a million miles away. I was just pouring out my heart to the Lord and he broke in and he said, Dave, don't you know that I love you? And I had to be honest, and I said, no. I mean, I, I'd forgotten, right? I'd forgotten that. I love the fact that the Spirit of Jesus comes to dwell with us, to teach us, and to remind us. To remind us of those things that we know, that remind us that in the midst of the stress and the anxiety and the pressures of the world, it just takes this moment to remind us. I remember sometime, one time an individual came to confession and they repented for not remembering. And I found myself praying in that evening and reflecting on that because it's rare that we repent for not remembering. But the scripture says time and time again, remember, remember, remember. This is what this is. The, the, the Greek word is this anamnesis, this active memory, this active remembering. 
And what the Spirit wants us wants to be able to do is to help to remind us in those moments that we most need that. Again, the advocate is the one who's going to come in and save the day and remind us what we need to know. And I find from experiences like this or when I lead pilgrimages, people are anxious at the end because they've heard so much and they're worried. It's like, I just want to remember everything, right? I just want to remember everything. I believe in a spirit of Jesus that's going to remind us when the time is necessary. And it may be a year from now and you're going to be in a situation with somebody at your work or somebody at the soccer field or somebody in the hospital and a memory is going to come back. And you're going to be able to share and being able to bring forth what you heard this weekend or 10 years ago because the spirit will remind you. Again, that's, that's why we're here is that Jesus invited us to return to this altar and to remember and allow him to remind us what he's done for us. Do me a favor, take a breath. Jesus, on this day of Pentecost, you sent the advocate to dwell with us, that we would not be orphaned. You will always be with us to teach us and to remind us so that we might be faithful in the mission you've given us. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen.